Okay, my name is Rhino Brim. You see it here. Interestingly. No, it's right. <laughs> I was from the good. My name is Ryan Brim. I'm a software developer since 1999, you see, since the last millennium. Around 22, 24, maybe it was more 26, I created a first education group in my company, and a side effect of this education group was, or first education group was, they asked me, hey, build a Python class for the entire class. So since 26 or so, I teach Python. You may know me more for C++, but I have also Python background. And the interesting fact is I started with a one version. You see, it's quite a time. Yo, this is essentially what you should know about me. And since 2016, I've been C++ trainer. But I still give Python seminars. Only 20-30%, we type 10 a year, but a few times. Sometimes I also give talks about Python, you see, a lot of time was this class. Therefore, this is a ideal topic for me when I talk how you how C C can interact with Python. Because this interaction is great and is heavily used in the industry. But honestly, extremely bad documented. There are many, many ways to do it. Now let's talk about extending and embedding Python. First of all, what's this extending? Second, what's embedding? Extending is quite easy. To make a shot, you have Python, you call C, C++ from Python, and this, was, this is extending. Embedding is the other way around. It's also used, but not so heavily. You have C, C++, and call Python from it, embedding. It makes a lot of sense. For example, what we did in our past was to, to make GUI tests, and the uh, GUI run with C++ was, re was recorded in Python. And then we could automate it with Python. Because the GUI run in C++ uh, wrote as a side effect Python instruction, which you can use to let it rerun in Python. So this was something we have done 2002 for even before who did anything in this direction. So right time. Honestly, I, I never did it, but my colleagues. OK, so what is, what is extend? Oh, extend. Range. Okay, we have to convert values from Python to C++. You use the converted values in C, C++, and then you convert it back. And embedding is exactly the opposite. You use essentially also the same uh, things, but the other way around. You have values, you convert them from C++ to Python, use them in Python, and then convert them back. So, the other way around. Um, 70, 80 percent of my talk is about the first part, extending. What's it? For me? No, no. Okay. I, I was only curious. And, and it, it, you see, I, I, I watch what you do. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Okay, you see. Why do we do such stuff? Why do you extend it on that? Here are two main reasons. First of all, you have already this functionality in C, C++. Why should you do it in Python? So just a dry principle. Don't repeat yourself. You may know NumPy, SkyPy, and this stuff. It's essentially this uh, uh, done with these techniques. Second, what you often do is you do something in Python, you realize, oh, this part is too slow. Then you re-implement it in Python, make a DLL, dynamic clean title, or Linux, SO, shell object out of it, and you evolve it from Python. Fine. Or Python has a big issue, which is not so big, but it has a big issue, which is so-called the GIL, Global Interpreter Log. Only the Python implementation in C, the other not. And the, the issue is the following. Only one thread can run at any point in time. Only one. Why? Because unless you have C, and C cannot be minus threaded. Therefore, you have a big, big log, which is called Global Interpreter Log. They try to get rid of it. Since 20, 20, 22, 24, so quite a time. But always they achieved it, the sequential execution of Python becomes slower, which is the issue. You, you know the story. Actually, no, but I consider some of the. Uh, but this is a really issue. There are many very interesting talks uh, which you can uh, listen from David Beersley. They seem to overcome it once more in Python 4. But I'm not sure. Honestly, I'm also not. The Python expert, such as I am, C++, I'm quite good Python, but not the expert, such as C++. 
Okay, there are a few reasons for dealing with the thing. Because C++, you can, for example, do in a uh, concurrent way since C++11. You only want to use the standard. Okay, let's talk about extent. I will talk about this in one, two, three, four, five different ways. Um, and, of course, each way becomes a little bit or way better. Let's start simple. What we need at first is a shared library, a DLL or an SO. By the way, all the things I did here and I showed to you here, I also did with Windows. It sometimes with it. Other, you have to do it differently, but it works also. But this is only what I show you the examples are Linux-based using, I think, mainly GCC. Okay, we need a shared library. How do we do a shared library? This is our Hello World. It has an, I start with the, the plus plus will follow. I start with a with header, I start with an implementation, and now I want to use this stuff from Python. What I do is, first of all, I need a shared library. I create position independent code, make a shared library out of it, and here only to prove it, I make an executable out of it and invoke it. Therefore, it's just a C executable execute. Okay. Now we have it. Now I want to use it from Python. The easiest way to do it, how many of you know C types? I'm only curious. It's built in into Python. Oh, oh, this is what I like. I want to ask you a new question. Do you have an idea how many libraries Python have in three? Python three, how many libraries? Why is this a term called better is included? There must be a reason for that. Any idea? The ones that Python itself supplies? Or but I, no, 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 don't talk about it. I cannot count. <laughs> okay. But the point is, what, how many stuff is in the Python standard library? Any gut feeling? 100? Below? Below? Below 300? Under 300? More than 300. In the standard. The issue in Python is not that you don't have it, you don't know which one you want to use. <laughs> And one of them is C-types. And C-types is a library which allows you to directly call shared objects from Python. This is extremely convenient. And this is what I do here. Have a look. This is the shared object I created before. And here I say, this is the Python REPL. The Python inter uh, interactive uh, command line to play with Python REPL. Read a valid print loop, short REPL. Here I say import C types, I import this module, which, I, which is part of the standard. Then I say C type C DLL node library, this is the one I created. And then I say hello world, hello world, this was it. So easy it is to call C, C++, or shared object from Python. And this is built in. So for the simple use case, you are totally fine with that. C types. Once more, you can do it also with Windows. The naming convention is a little bit different, but anyway, it works also. And here I do a little bit more sophisticated stuff. I say import C types, then I load the libc. Why? Because it's faster than the Python version. No, I'm kidding. I load libc, and then I can invoke libc time. Here are the times since the epoch. Then I call libc printf because Python 3 has Unicode. I have to say it's a byte string. You see? Hello world. This is the C printf. Just invoked. And here I can do it with a little bit of a format string, which I honestly don't love, but anyway, do it. With a format string. And the issue here is that Python knows int by, uh, by nature, but not a double. Therefore, I have to say, hey, this is a double. And here I see it. And here, this is only the length of the string, which we see. And we can do also do it more conveniently. We can specify function prototype, you see? Printf wants to have three arguments. A character pointer, a character pointer, an in, and a double. And now I can ignore it without specifying the type, because I said it. And the same goes for the return value. When I use string chair to get the string starting with W, see? String chair, I don't know how to pronounce string chair. By default, it assumes it's an int. 
It's not the right thing we want to have. Therefore, I have to say, hey, it's a, it's, it's a chart. Right? And therefore, now we see what. And of course, I can com combine both. This was an extremely simple example, but it's, you see, it's so easy this to call combine uh, existing here. Essentially, it's so easy, it's so transparent that you don't, you may not recognize that you call it C function, not Python function. Uh, in the former days in Python, there were often two modules. One was called mass, and one was called C mass. The mass was implemented in Python, the C mass in, in C. And when you call it, Python just looks for the master one. Nowadays, you don't see it in Python 3 anymore. They just unified the uh, notation of the, the names. OK. Or oh, something was missing, but this wasn't so interesting. Let's continue. Let me do it the hard way. Do it by myself. You should not do it, but, but only to see it. So now I want, want to do something similar, which I did with C types. Let's see. I have this hello world dot c file. I create an extension module, a library out of it, or a shell object. And this is how I do it. These are only the, uh, the, the main points. This is C functionality, which is, how should I say it, improved with Python. And this is, this are the Python, this is the Python object to which all falls down by object. What, what this is C? And, um, yo, this gives me something which I can afterwards invoke from Python. First of all, I need the functionality, therefore I have to include this header file. It's, I think, part of the uh, package py python uh, slash dev or something like that, oh, uh, minus dev. Then here, this is the prototype of the function I want to invoke. This is a C function. Here I define the method table, meaning the function I want to be invocable from Python. This is only overview. I uh, dive one step deeper in a few uh, next slides. Then here I define the module. A module is something what which you import. This is what you say import. This, for example, this is a module, or library, anyway. Here is the definition of the C function, declaration, definition. And this here is the initialization of the module, meaning when you say import something, this function, uh, this, yeah, this function will be called, and this initializes the stuff. And you see there are a lot of lines missing. Let's talk about missing lines. This must be the first line, python.h. It includes additional stuff, st standard I.O., string H, and so on and so on. All symbols which are provided by Python follow, follow one naming convention, py.y, either written in capital or a big or a capital or a small letter. This is just a naming convention which helps to identify that. Okay, this was the first part. This is the method table. Here I define, when I invoke from Python hello world, this is mapped to this C function, this stands for the arguments, and this is the documentation string. You know, each object in Python has a documentation string, which is called underscore, underscore, doc, underscore, underscore. In short, who knows how Python people call this underscore, underscore, doc, underscore, underscore. The under stands for double under. Double under. Because when you say, oh, you have to overload, you have to, you have to write underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. Terrible. Under init. I thought it came from Harry Potter. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and Python, all things come from Monty Python. Yeah. <laughs> this is the reason Correct. why it's called Monty Python. <laughs> this, is, this is not a joke. <laughs> Good if it was a big Monty Python. Okay, but you see, this is the do documentation still, which is a test uh, attached to standard doc. Name of the Python method, name of the C function, calling conventions, documentation string, and this is the sentinel, meaning you could have more than one function, then you have to say this is all. This is 
the mesa table? This is the module. This is the name of the module. Hello world. This is the documentation stack of the module. Each object has a documentation stack, which is by default an empty string. Uh, size of the data state, name of the method table. This is the table which I refer to here, which you see here. And then the final step. No. Oh, this is too slow. Go ahead. Yeah, this is the final step. This is the stuff which is called when I say import module. When you say import module, let me start here. This returns a Python object. You see, this is a, oh, this is actually a macro, anyway. Um, this is the initialization function. Ex this hello world here must exactly match to the name of the module. There are a lot of naming conventions you have to follow. You will get ugly, ugly error messages. Sometimes you have to add some on the score here, some on the score there. Don't do it by yourself. I said it in a few minutes. Use tools. This is terrible. In particular, when you go to Windows, they want to have uh, underscore in a different place. This is terrible. Mm. And this creates the what you see, creates the new tool, and returns it to, to the caller. Meaning, when you say import something, you have it. Okay, this was an extremely simple module. And, ah, yeah. One of these more than 300 modules is this or this. This is a, uh, this is a module to help you to build packages which you can, for example, use for, uh, you wanted to mention it before, uh, uh, to add to PIP, to the Python uh, index. What is the name of PIP? Let me make a joke. Who, was, who knows who, what was the formerly name of PIP, the original name of PIP? PIP. Why? Because of only Python. Exactly. <laughs> this was, <laughs> you, you know this cheat shop deck? No, yeah. you should not talk about it. It's more awesome. Okay. Okay, and this is how I define my package. What is essential is that it's an extension module consisting of this C file, you see it here. This is the name of it. Uh, the name of it is always here. And this is additional stuff. There's a lot of stuff you can add, but essentially this this um, key value pass are essential. And then when you import it, it invokes this main, this is the so-called main hook, and this stuff is in work and process and something is done. And when you want to do it, oh, voila. when you want to do it, you just say python setup.p, this was the file I, sh I showed you in the last slide. Then you say build it and do it in place, therefore you can use it. And this is something you can upload to PIM, which follows the, this uh, semantic. Or you can uh, install locally what I did here. You see, I built it and <laughs> Of course, you don't want to uh, type in this command line. And this is what you get. And then afterwards, I say, in the same place, because if, you, if not, you would not find it. It's a search path issue, so if not. You say import hello. You can look inside. And these are the keys, which are in the module. And the essential key is this attribute here, which is hello world which is the function which I now can invoke because it's all the, or it's a function set, sorry. Any question about this? Because I'm not sure how good your Python knowledge is. I know that you are quite good in C++. So is it a case like when things get loaded up, it looks through a symbol table for the symbol that matches it? That you, 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 might, you mean this? Yeah, the entire loading process, yeah. Python is extremely simple and extremely easy. All in Python is a dict. A dict is a dictionary. A dictionary has a key value association. All is a dict, really all. And what you get here essentially are the keys of the dictionary. So when you call it as a return value, you get the function body in which you can call because it's all callable. In, in Python, all is a dictionary. Each scope, each object, all is a dictionary. It's unbelievable. And Name lookup is just chained lookup in dictionaries. So when you say, I don't know a dictionary, you know it, unordered map, or hash table, or associative array, there are so many names for it. Sometimes also wrongly called map, but anyway. And you know what is the key? Sorry, I should not, no. 
I will say. What's the key thing about a DICT? Constant access time. If not, pine would be terrible slow with all this DICT. Constant access time. I don't talk here about hash function, this stuff in buckets and so on. Maybe you want to visit the workshop. I think that's possible. But I can also say to you. Okay. Uh, you, the reason why I give so much additional stuff is because I might be too fast. Okay, then we have SWIG. It's extremely old, and now we want to automate it. You saw this was possible, but this was quite a chunk. So for it was also extremely easy. We didn't do any C++ like things. We just invoked a function to see. With SWIG you can do more, but I will still stick to C and with pipeline 11 I will go one level up, meaning C++. Because, because I'm C++, I will see it. SWIG, uh, did any one of you ever use SWIG? Okay, it's quite old. I think it's from 1995, 1994, extremely old. Goes back to David Bietzli, which I already mentioned, extremely, extremely extremely competent programmer. And what it stands for is simplified rapid interface generator. So it's way, way, way more as just a generator for C bindings. It creates bindings for many, many languages, including Python. So when you have the issue that you want to create bindings for not only, but for different languages, this may be your choice. Um, it's nowadays not so heavily used anymore, but it's still a, a, a valid tool and it is still updated. When did you use it? Someone of you said you used it when, when was it? Ages ago. Ages ago. This is what I assume. Did you switch in the meantime to something else? Uh, I just like did some experiments and yeah, I didn't actually need it at the time, but I just wanted to see how it works. Yeah, okay. It supports essentially 98 up to 17, but uh, I, I, I honestly, and I also uh, have a quote from David, mm, it's a little bit old fashioned or not the way. It's, mm, it's quite robust to do it, but it, it works. But it's outstanding story is that you cannot only bind to Python, but to different programming languages you like. Yeah? So does it bind from all these languages to every other language? That uh, what, it, what it does is essentially it generates you, um, when you know Korba or when you know uh, SOAP or something like that, it's generating a programming language specific interface file which you have to implement. You have a meta language in, in which you describe your interface and then you have a generator which generates you from it's called stuff in skeleton or something like that and this is the stuff you have to implement. I, once more, I'm not 100 sure, sure if these are the right terms because it's not the corner terms, but this is the similar idea. And here's the interface file. This dot .e, this is the interface file. This is the name of the module, this is what you need, the header, and this is what you export. So extremely simple, extremely simple. I only want to support my hello world. And now I use this interface generator, you see, swig minus python hello world.e. There's also a flag which is called similar to C++, then you have a C++ binding. And now what you get is two things, you see, hello world.e. This is what you in, uh, import and invoke from python. This is the um, stuff to which it's meant to. And this is what's, what's created. And I assume that this guy here is extremely active, but anyway. This is what you get. You see, hello world, 11, 100,000, oh yeah, <laughs> just count here. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff inside, probably. And now what you have to do, this is a kind of the interface description in a C-like way. And now you have to implement this way, meaning you have to do this stuff here. Because you promised you want to make an interface to this implementation. And this is what I did. And you see, I did the same such as before. This is almost the same uh, setup file such as 
before. I did it, and then I can say import hello world. I can look inside this module, and now you see there's more to it. We have some mm, special attributes, whatever that means. We have the name of the module, as always, the file name of the module, the documentation string of the modules. Okay, what can I see here? And of course, we have the name of the function, which is just a key that did. And now I can use it to invoke it. Any questions so far? Go on. Uh, by the way, you should use the mic. This is fine. No. <laughs> sorry. If not, I have to repeat it, which is not a good idea. Yeah, sorry, I think I missed this. How did the dot i file get generated? This is this has, this is your job. Oh, okay. This is always you you define the interface file in which you promise what you would provide. And based on the interface file, this generator creates your interface this, uh, interface specific for the programming I'm, you are aiming for. And now you have to implement the implementation for it. This is always how an IDL was, ID, uh, interface definition language works. There's a meta language. This is how RPC works. Maybe you don't know because you are too young. But this is what, how it's done, was done in, part, in the past. It's always the same idea. A meta language, is, which you describe your interface, it creates a binding for language and you have to implement it. Thanks. I'm open for questions because I, as always... Uh, a very simple question. What's in that file that takes 110 kilobytes? It's just C-magic stuff. <laughs> now I, we can look inside. But I, honestly, the nice thing about auto-generate code is that you never look at it. No, this is really ugly. This, in Python, there's a big, big case statement which has 100,000 lines of code to match to them. This is a terrible file. And, uh, by the way, I, has case, I hate case statements. I never looked. Uh, maybe I looked inside. I have it here. If you are old enough, I can show it to you later. But not now. <laughs> I have all the stuff here. So, But honestly, I don't care. I care about obstruction, not about implementation. I don't care that understood on the C++ assembly runs. I don't care. Okay, any additional questions? What's the wrong direction? And now we come to the final point, which is essentially what I want to say. If you do something like I showed you before, use PyPy. 11 is based, it's called 11 because it's based on C++ 11, but it goes up to 17. It's extremely nice, extremely convenient, and extremely easy to read. And honestly, <laughs> you read it, you immediately understand it, or you can extend it. So PyPy 11, seamless operability between C++ and 11 and uh, Python. 11 is a lie, because you can do 17, but anyway. It's fully implemented in header files. OK. Why? Because it's originally from Boost, but it's cut. Uh, you know Boost. Boost by David Abrams started as a Python project. And he, he implemented Boost Python. But there are so many dependencies inside to other libraries from Boost that they cut it out and made it a, a, a project in its own. But the original is Boost Python, uh, Boost Python sorry, from David Abrams. And here you can do both. You can extend and expand in that. You can call from Python C, C, C++, and you can do also the other way around. Uh, only a deal. This is essentially, I could now mention each feature we can use, or we can say just all, as you like it. I just ignore it. So all what you want to do, even <laughs> Even you can make Python more powerful by using PyPy language, which is for me extremely interesting. Because Python has also limitations. Its programming language has limitations. Let's start. This is all, by the way, the only complicated stuff, 
uh, step is the compilation step, but there are CMake files for it. Please don't try to do it by yourself, in particular on Windows. This is really the challenge. There are, we have search for CMake files which you can use, which make this automatically. But this is extremely easy. So, do you know what's happening here? Any idea? Only to show it to you without explanation. Yeah, I will explain something. But go on. Uh, I'm assuming what you're doing is this is a, mac a magic mac macro. The PyBind 11 is a magic macro that's going to say there's a function that I want to explore, and you get some sort of context object in that lambda that you then add functions to. Okay, yeah. So, this, first of all, this is the C, C function I want to invoke. I say, I, I create a binding, I call it M, I bind something to this thing, which is my module, I call it from its Python add, it maps to the add in C, this is the, uh, this is the doc documentation thing. You see, extremely easy to explain, extremely convenient to read. Of course, you have it in one file, one stuff in another file, the other, but anyway. Okay, this was easy. There's a convention. You don't call pi bind, uh, you use the full name, you just operate pi bind 11 by pi. So, you see, instead of pi bind 11 arc, I say only pi arc. And here's the first thing which is interesting. Do you know that you can invoke in Python func uh, function arguments by name? which we cannot do in C, C. This means when you have a function, it has argument E and Y, y uh, G, sorry, E and G, which are bad name, but anyway. You can invoke it by saying E equal 5, G equal 10, or do it the other way around if you like. And in particular, when you combine this with default arguments, this is extremely powerful. This is something we want to have, but we don't have in C++. Only an extremely, hmm, Simple version is designated in citation C++ value. Okay, and this is what I can do. I can see, I can say, okay, keyword arguments. So I can call them by position, but also by name. And I can even say, I want to have default arguments. Or to give you an idea. And you see, this is extremely convenient to read. And there's even more. Oh yeah, now once more, I like to do it. Do you know what is extremely astonishing here? I have, what is it? I implement overloading, you see? I implement two versions of sum, which I call in Python, and I map to different function in C. Does something here makes you curious? What is it? Does Python support function overloading? Can you write a function sum taking two or three arguments? No, why not? Because all is a dictionary, there's only one key. This is the limitation of the dict. It's even, even, honestly it's not worse, but this is a characteristic of Python. It's even more. In Python, you can not distinguish between an attribute and a method because both are called add. Some is just callable and nothing other not. This is the all, all difference. And now see what we can do. We can create two sum functions callable from Python, which map to two, diff, two different C functions or C functions anyway, having two or three arguments. And this is once more. <laughs> Python becomes more powerful with Python than now we have overloading. And of course, we can have attributes, just a little bit playing with stuff. And here's how I use it. I say from function import star to, to use it unqualified. If not, I would say would have to say function dot uh, add and so on and so on. Uh, by the way, in general, you should not do it, but I did it anyway. Um, add, I use, I use the name. I use the name in the uh, different sequence. So the, I use the default values, I use sum is two with, with three arguments, and here just attributes. 
And once more, of course, the usage is easy, but also the definition is extremely convenient. I, I, I don't think you have to be a little bit used to the syntax in this order. Go on. I'm confused, but you said that Python is This is some magic done internally of PyBind 11. And essentially, or maybe it's, maybe it's a, oh sorry, it's a cast. This is more than a magic, this is just a cast. It just maps to a different implementation function on the C side. I don't know how it's internally done. You can study it, you have to, this is all a uh, header only. But I never looked inside. But once more, what is really, really astonishing for me, now you can do thing, things in Python which are by definition not doable because you have predict. This is honestly not a limitation Python. There are other things to overcome these issues. In Python, <laughs> what always astonished me most, you know, Vector has 10 different constructors in Python. In, 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 in C++, sorry. In Python, we are Python is one. Because there's only one done they need. But it works. Okay. Let's do a little bit more. Now we start with real object orientation of C++. This is my class. Human being, a constructor taking a constant stripping, um, a function get name, returning the string, and uh, uh, attributes uh, name. And this is all what you have to do to support this stuff from Python. You see how less this is. I just say, uh, uh, what is it? This creates a class. I bind it to M. This is kind of a convention to call, um, how should I say it? To map the Python constructor to a C++ construct, you see? This, I, I, I know this looks a little bit strange, but you have to see it once and you see what's happening here. Because in Python, the corresponding function is called dunder in it, so it's kind of also of a name match. And this is when I call get name, it should be dispatched to human being get name. But for me, it's extremely convenient to read. But there's more to it, which is extremely nice. Who knows what the, the function done the wrapper does in Python? It returns you as computer readable string representation of your object. If, if this is not provided, what you get in return is the address of the object. In wrapper, you have two things, to understand, done the wrapper, and the is the okay. And you see what I do here? I say, when you call from Python, when you want to display my object, use this lambda. And this is for me extremely elegant. I can even implement a so-called uh, uh, overloader call operator, and uh, the call operator, overloader operator. So you can write attributes which are read, write. We have also read and write, you see. Family name is an attribute which maps to this family name here. It's a read write, so you can modify it. And what is extremely easy also, you can over uh, you can derive. By the way, Python supports multiple inheritance, but in Python it's very, very more easy. C supports multiple inheritance. You can also do it here, but I didn't do it. Okay, you see, this is a by human being. This is the a constructor of a human being. And this is woman derived from human being. And here's the uh, constructor from, from woman. So this is, of course, I need the corresponding C code, but this is the Python uh, way to call it. And you see, this is all extremely convenient, extremely compact, it's extremely easy to readable. Pipeline 11. Here I play a little bit with this. So, from human, human imports star, therefore I can use it unqualified. Then, then here I create a woman, I call her Bea because, <laughs> sorry, this is my life. Um, then I display, you see, human being Beatrix, right? 
hold them from direction because you will be bearish. Then I can look here, this is once more, I can look inside the dictionary of bear. You can look inside each object, but also inside each class. And this is what, uh, what makes a bear, you see? And this is a gender, a family name, and cat name, and these are all the bando methods. So for example, this, uh, this is uh, meant for greater than, this, are, this is operator overloading Python, by the way. So the Dunder stuff is well defined, but this is operator law for how it's done in Python. And then I can ask Bea for the family name, and you know my name, so you know her. Get name. The gender. Gender is a function, meaning when I invoke it on a function, and I do, don't do it here as a function call, only as an object call, you see? The part is something here. I just get, I get to turn, uh, uh, meta information. But now when I use it as a function, as a call, I get a uh, gender, which is female, and also a name. Print is also something which is used by wrapper, such as displaying it in the wrapper. Question about it? What was it? Okay. This was it about um, extending. And I strongly suggest when you want to go in two direction, really consider pipeline in the world. This is way, way more convenient than the other stuff. And there's way more, way more to it in regard to feature. Please go to market. I, I, I have to say that. <laughs> so you mentioned that uh, the compilation is very complex and can cause uh, some caveats for pipeline 11. Uh, would that how would that work with uh, cross-platform like Linux, Windows? This is the reason there's a CMake file which you can use. On Windows, uh, on Linux, there's, there's a, a special Python, uh, I can show it to you, I don't have it in my head, I hope that's right. There's a special Python binary which you can invoke, which returns you as side effect, the headers you need and the libraries you need. But this is not available on Windows, I don't know why. Therefore, look for the CMake file. I have it, by the way. And then it was, uh, what, how should I say, a piece of cake, even on Windows. But you don't want to play until you finally get this command line. On Windows, it's, by the way, it's sometimes extremely complicated because you have to know that you build the C and C++ stuff with the same compiler such the one you use for Python. This is always, this is sometimes extremely tricky. But when you have um, how should I, achieved it once, it works. The, the, the platform, in a particular, creating a DLL in, 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 Linux, in, in Windows is also totally different from doing it in Linux. But you have to do it once, but it's doable. If you are real curious, I can give you one material. Okay. Now let's talk about the other direction, which is of course not so long. Embedding. So the other way around. Instead from Python working C, C++, we do the other way around. Ex essentially you have three ways to do it. You can execute a string, you can execute a module, or you can explicitly execute Function from a Python module. What's more, from C. I show you all three use cases. Technically, this is exactly the other thing, the same thing, but the other way around. This is, you see, a C program from which I, in, uh, which I execute Python code. Import time, and then print time dot C time time time. And it gives me, uh, I think, the code type. First of all, you have to initialize Python. Then you have to shut down the interpreter. In the between, to say, Py run simple string, which is provided by this header here. And this one. This is this. This invokes Python from C, C++. 
And once more, we did, I will come to you, we did something similar in our uh, past. We had, a, we had a big tool doing crash simulation of cars. And what we did was we let this run from C, C++. We wrote down all the instructions we did in Python, and then afterwards we could, uh, we can, could batch our GUI run and test it, for example. You can do that crazy stuff. Yeah. Okay. I, is that? Yeah. I, I got three questions. Oh, stop. Um, is this spinning up a separate process, or is this executing Python within the program? This is, I'm not 100% sure, sure, but I don't assume this, this, this will not be a separate process, because you would do it differently. Because a separate process would, would, would not, this is an easy thing to do. And, then, and the second one is, um, I'm assuming we include the header, but at link time, are you also having to include some sort of um, SO or some library that actually contains all of Python into your executable? Honestly, I forgot it. The reason why I forgot it is it was extremely simple. I can show you the command line. It was not so complicated. And then I'm assuming when it prints, it's actually printing to standard out in this uh, sort of case. Um, uh, yeah. And so does the print occur when you finalize or when you say run? Is that at the point of it, at that run sort of statement, is it dropping <laughs> into it? and extremely specific question. But I, I assume it will happen here. So maybe here, you know what I mean. Right, so it goes into the function, brings up Python, runs through the execution of mm -hmm. that particular one, ex, uh, sort of interpretation of it. I right? never analyzed it so far. I just look what Python supports, what you can do. But this is what I, for the first question, I would just say no separate interpreter. And here I would say with high, high probability. Because if not, it would be crazy. Honestly, it would be crazy. You sleep a little bit and then it runs at the end. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it would be crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I know, I know. Thank you. Okay, this was the first thing. By the way, this works on white Windows or on Linux. Or not the boss. Combination is really not complicated. I have all here, I can show it to you. And this is what happens when you execute it. Short time. Once more, this string is provided by Tyson, and this is of course C. Yeah, C what you can also do is run an entire module. module. This is my module, you see? Just importing time, and then do the same such as before, using print uh, print from Python three. And this is what I have to do. I have to initialize it. I have to final finalize it. I have to open the file, and I say run simple file short time for right. So easy. And now is something really uh, sophisticated, and here you can do really, really sophisticated things. I will not go this through, but anyway. I can execute functions from a Python module. And here's my idea. This is a mass module, my mass.p. It has a few functions. A faculty function, which calculates the faculty of numbers, so we saw it already in, uh, what was it, in Timo's talk, faculty of five is, we saw it, short. <laughs> so yeah, I would use five here, I would uh, use reduce. If you don't know reduce, you should know C++, this is what we call C++. Accumulate. Stood accumulate, but in 70 we are also stood reduce. Anyway, this is, a, this is a reduction. Then we have here a print function, uh, some function, and I have a product function. Or oh, it have three functions. It's a bit of math. In Python, now I want to use it from C. Because I say C cannot do such things. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is how I do it. I create an executable, which I show you in a few seconds. A C executable, which gets a module. And then I say, I, from this module, use this function, use this arguments. And you see C function, 
This is my module, the one I showed you before. This is my function with 10, and you see, faculty of 10, I'm happy that I didn't ask you, because it's even more than faculty of 5. And you see, now I have an interplay from C in pi. Pi plus this, C plus plus returns to the side. Only, and then I went to C. This Python string is the one provided here. And this is the stuff which is part of my C file, which I now give you a, 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 a simple idea of it. This is essentially what you have to do in run python.function.c. I will not show you the entire file, because it's a little bit longer, but this is essentially what you have to do. What do you have to do in the C file is following. You have to read a command line. You have to pass the command line. You see? You have, to, you have to deal with this stuff here. Second, Python has to find the module, meaning you have to uh, extend the module search pass. And this is, in Python, part of the module sys and the variable the pass. So you have to extend it and you have to say Python. When you look for the module, module or here my mass, here's what you have, here is what this search is what you should consider. Addition. This is what I have to do on the C level. Because I, I search it, I, I should find it. Then, wrong direction. Then I have to import the module. Uh, then I have to call the Python function, pass the function arguments, call the Python function, and return the result back to C because C wants to use it. This is essentially what you have to do. And let me see if I have a little bit more. Yeah, here is a little bit more how it looks like under hood. So, the same step once more, but a little bit more in the details. Here I import them into sys. You see, this is C, C syntax. From, which is uh, provided essentially by Python. Then I add the extender module pass by pass. Ah, no. So it's pass, and here I say this is the correction. Please look at the current module I, I'm running. You know, the dot means in the Unix world, the current, uh, the, the current position in the file system. Then I insert the module, import PLA, this is the module. Afterwards, I pass the arguments. And you see, this is all what is provided by the infrastructure. Of course, now it's way, way, way long level. Then I call from C Python this function with these arguments. I got back the result, and then I print the result in C. And I have to convert it uh, to C. And this is what I essentially have to do. And of course, this is a script having made a uh, C file having 50 lines or something. Like that. But these are the essential steps you have to do. And this is really interesting. Calling from C things out of a module. Okay. And this was fine because now I'm done. Extend embed. Once more, the big, big story is, of course, extended, not in that, but you can also do it after the project. So, um, again, going, uh, going a bit uh, back to uh, embedding uh, the Python, <laughs> if you are to, let's say, redistribute the application, right? You, would you need to include all the Python core libraries and all that with it, or would it no? You would have to at least install, I think, Python minus dev, it's the package. And you have to include it in the search pass and stuff like that. This right. is what you have to do, of course. Yeah. Uh, this brings in all Python functions into the scope. Yeah, it's more like when I'm build, after I'm done building my application, do I need to ship anything else but my executable, or it will have the... No, you need, of course, the Python runtime, which you can also do in an extremely strange, but maybe if you don't know it, 
the project is so called through frozen Python, which means you you make out uh, you let the Python runtime run in the uh, in the me uh, in the memory, meaning you don't install it; you just use it. But this is a different story. But essentially, this is what you have to do. You need the Python runtime. Okay. Thank you. And of course, all the additional stuff that you want to use, see, make quick. Uh, this is what you have to install Python. But this was not the issue. The issue was really to do pipeline manually. Yeah. For me, at least. On Windows. Windows sorry. Are you, is there any work being done to combine reflections in C++, I guess, 20, whenever it's going to come out, and pipelines? No, this is the wrong answer, but you're right. There's a discussion about reflection, but you will not get reflection in 23, maybe 26, 28. But to make it short, big Features need a long time. The discussion with modules, with concepts, started around 25, 24. And, the same, and I think reflection is such an important feature this will take. And the, the key point, let me, put, let me put it this way. I often give seminars for Python in, in C++, and the Python guys uh, complain about C++, the other guys, you know, you know. I, I hate it. And, but I have to say something which is very important. Reflection at runtime is easy. You have, you have just to implement an additional type system to the existing one which you can ask at runtime. At runtime. This is even described in the Gang of Four book from 1994, so it's not so uh, rocket science. But at compile time, this is a challenge. And this is what we want to do. Because we have a meta in C++, which is called, don't pay for anything you don't use. We won't have it, but it should cost anything. Only to give you my point, I, I, I love Python, I love C++, but sometimes you cannot compare it. So, Second question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, could you, like how far... Uh, in the inception graph can you go? Can you extend Python to call C that's embedded Python that calls into something where you've extended? This is what I mentioned, you can go crazy. <laughs> but this is your job, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, you should have a use case. And don't do it, what Pulp always say, why do you do it? Because we can. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a motivation. It's extremely interesting for me to also sometimes talk about time, you know? <laughs> okay. Fine? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.